Hello, I'm Wes Combs from Kozala Company. Today we're going to talk about clustered systems, what they are, components in them, and then we're going to talk about a, an installation we did for 47 homes in central Kentucky. So let's begin. Cluster systems are typically thought of as systems that accept effluent from more than one structure or facility's pretreatment unit and transport this collected effluent through a sewer system and then to an advanced treatment system and subsurface treatment and dispersal systems. And these can be of a lot of different types of designs. I'll show you one later in the presentation that was typical of how Zolop is involved with these. Cluster system options. Typically, we see two different options available. The three houses on the left. Pretreatment is done at each home. So each home on each lot then will have a septic tank for pretreatment. This partially treated effluent then will flow to a community collection system. And then from there, it'll flow to a community treatment and final dispersal system. So in this case, only pretreatment is done on each lot. On the right side, uh, you'll see the same three houses with a septic tank for pretreatment. But on each lot, we'll do advanced treatment. So each home will have its own advanced treatment system to treat the effluent to a very high degree. And then this highly treated effluent will flow to a community collection system and then to a final disposal or dispersal system. So these are a couple of ways that we do this often. And I would estimate that the one on the left, we do far more often than we do on the right. But either option is available and there's advantages and disadvantages to both of these options. Typical cluster system components will involve septic tanks with pretreatment, which we've discussed. Oftentimes, because of elevation changes throughout the development, we're going to have pump tanks installed to carry the pretreated effluent to the advanced treatment system and dispersal system, for example. And within these pump tanks, we're going to typically use a step system with a turbine pump, and we'll talk a little bit more about those. Pumps will then flow to a low-pressure effluent collection system. Talk more about that in a bit too. And then finally to an advanced treatment system for the entire cluster system or community, and then to a soil absorption system for final disposal or dispersal. Just a bit about septic tanks, since these are so widely used in cluster systems and septic systems in general in the U.S. Normally, septic tanks are going to be made from concrete, plastic, sometimes fiberglass. There's going to be three distinct layers on the inside of these tanks if you've not been exposed to these before. The top layer is going to be called a scum layer. And that's going to be flooding materials such as toilet tissues and grease that'll come from the house. The bottom layer is a sludge layer. And this is going to be solids that are settling out from the incoming waste as it's going through treatment. That's heavier and falls to the bottom as a sludge. And then this zone in the middle, this gray zone in the middle, that's labeled wastewater. We also call that the clear zone. And that's the zone we're trying to pick up effluent from to move that out to the advanced treatment system into a final dispersal. Oftentimes we'll use a screen or a filter on the right side. You'll see that installed a cutaway and that'll screen some of the solids that'll be in there. One important thing to note about a septic tank is they're very good for pretreatment. Been used for years and years and years. The one thing to note about them is that you're going to get somewhere between about 25 to 50 percent treatment efficiency from them. So, in other words, the raw waste coming in from the house will be treated to about 25 to 50% efficiency by the time it goes out. So then we have to do some type of other treatment, additional treatment typically. In most conventional septic tanks, that'll be final dispersal into a soil system then, which will do the final treatment before it enters the groundwater typically. So just a note on that, because we're gonna talk about primary treatment, which are septic tanks, and then we'll get into the advanced treatment or secondary treatment as we move through the presentation. Step systems are typically what we'll use and, uh, and we'll install inside of a separate pump tank or sometimes a two compartment septic tank and we'll install these plastic vaults as you can see on the right hand side. And also in that center picture, the green one looking down, these are rotomolded plastic vaults, typically 60 inches in height, but they're available in various heights depending on the size of the pump tank, the depth of the pump tank. But they're going to be installed into the tank, as you can see on the graph on the left, cross section on the outlet end. They're installed and hanged on inside the pump tank. And the key features to this is that it has a turbine pump in it. Sometimes it'll have a centrifugal pump, depending on the version. 
you'll see both over on the right. The one on the immediate left on the right screen has a turbine pump in it, and the far right steps has a centrifugal pump in it. We use those for a couple of different purposes, but the one we're going to talk about today is one that has a turbine pump in it. Those are high pressure, low volume systems. That typically, they work very well for step collection systems. And the key feature here is that everything is contained inside the vault. We've got the pump in the vault, we've got the float switches in the vault, and we have a float tree in the vault. And then a very important feature is that we're flowing the effluent up in the top middle section of the vault. It enters and then it'll flow through septic tank filters, which have 1 16th inch filter screens. And they're going to filter any large particles that are remaining in that septic tank effluent. Anything above a 16th of an inch is going to be filtered out and remain in that tank so it doesn't get into the distribution system or the advanced treatment system as we move it down the line. Next part that's common in the cluster system is a low pressure collection system. And all this is is just because we're flowing, we have pretreated effluent from a septic tank typically at each home, and then we've screened that to a 16th of an inch before it enters. We're able to use very small diameter PVC for the collection network. Usually it's two to four inches in diameter, depending on the size of the system, how much volume we're pumping, how far we're pumping. And you can see it's been put in over on the right side, just with a trencher. It's usually installed very shallow. It is usually below the frost line. We don't have freezing issues. Uh, the shallow installation allows us to get away from typically digging rock out and more costly installations as in conventional systems. And so these systems can go in easily. Typically, the installation costs are going to be very low. Sewer so hookup at each lot, just like you would have a conventional system, municipal system. So after the collection system is in, the contractor is going to bring a sewer hookup right to each lot with a cap on it. When the home is being built, the septic tank will be installed, the pump tank will be installed, and it'll connect to that sewer hookup, just like on a conventional system. Again, we're pumping partially treated effluent with an effluent pump. That's important because with this partially treated effluent, you don't have a lot of solids moving through the line, and you don't have solids build up typically in, in these systems because we'll maintain an adequate scouring velocity but it's low solid content anyway. So we don't have conventional lift stations. We're pumping directly to usually an advanced treatment system. We will have clean outs installed along the way for maintenance. We have to keep maintenance in mind on this entire system all the way from the home to the advanced treatment system out into the final dispersal system. Again, I said lower components and installation cost, and that's due to the smaller diameter PVC. It's due primarily to installation costs because we're keeping them shallow. We're not installing eight, 10 foot deep like many conventional sewers are. And because there's few components in the collection system, and because we're using clean defluent, we have lower operation maintenance costs too. Very, very friendly for maintenance. Okay, what we're gonna do now is take you through an advanced treatment system that we installed as a cluster system in central Kentucky on 47 homes. And I mentioned earlier that septic tanks will do approximately 25 to 50 percent treatment on a residential application or waste strength. And recirculating media filters, which is what we're going to talk about today, like a lot of advanced treatment systems, will treat the effluent to 90 to 95 percent efficiency. So septic tanks, which are primary treatment, approximately 25 to 50 percent treatment efficiency. And then advanced treatment systems that are installed, designed, and, and maintained properly are going to give a 90 to 95 percent treatment efficiency. So with that treated effluent that comes from these advanced treatment systems, it gives us a lot more flexibility in how we dispose of that effluent. Okay, so what you're looking at on the left is a rectangular excavation with gravel in it and distribution piping. And we're going to go through the details of that as we move through it. Again, 47 homes. In central Kentucky, just south of Lexington, Kentucky, is where this was located. This home has a golf course on it also, which you can see portions of in the background on the left side, where we actually installed the final dispersal system, which is a drip irrigation system. I'll show you that here as we move through it. Okay, recirculating media filter. The basis of this design comes from sand filters or recirculating sand filters, which have been used for many, many years. One of the problems with recirculating sand filters is they tend to get plugged. The fan media, which is a treatment medium, tends to get plugged over a period of time. 
we're dosing partially treated effluent, 25 to 50% treated effluent from septic tanks out on into a sand media. And then that sand media has to remove the solids and then the bacteria that grow in the sand then have to digest that. So what's happened over a period of time and what we've learned is sand media often is very hard to get with proper sizing in it. It's usually not clean depending on where it comes from and how well the provider of the media washed it. And so what's happened with sand filters is they get plugged over a short period of time. And then all the distribution piping that doses the effluent to the sand media has to be removed. And then all the sand has to be removed and disposed of. And then new sand has to be put back in. And then the distribution pipe is reconnected. So not a great plan. They don't have a long lifespan. What we've learned is if we upsize that media from a sand media to a 3 8 inch cleaned pea gravel, we can get excellent treatment, but we don't have the plugging that we get with sand media. So this is an excavation that's going to be a rectangular excavation into the soil, usually about four and a half feet deep. Final depth is about four and a half feet deep. The contractor will install a wood frame around it to build up the walls. That's simply there to hold the gravel that's going to be put into it, the pea gravel and the piping until it's backfilled around the outside of it. So it's there as a temporary measure to hold the treatment medium. First thing we do is we lay down felt protectant onto the soil to keep the liner from puncturing. All this, by the way, is part of a kit that Claris Environmental sells. Where we'll have all the components necessary for the recirculating media filter, except for the media, which is brought to the site locally. But we'll supply all the materials for the media filter, including the distribution laterals, the EPDM liner, 45 mil liner, all the piping, the boot seals where you pierce the liner, zone valves, pumps, controls, so on and so forth. So you can see they're rolling out the protective felt on the left to protect the liner. Liner's installed over on the right-hand side. And you can see it's a, it's a big excavation. You know? And we seam seal these ourselves at Zoller so that they're waterproof, watertight. We're going to have a, a collection system in the bottom of the filter, um, an underdrain system. Most of the time what we do is we'll use leaching chambers, which is what you've seen here on the big filters. Mm -hmm. uh, leaching chambers are a good alternative for us. They allow long lifespan. The holes in the sides of the chambers don't become plugged easily with any solids. They allow effluent to move through freely. So we're going to put down these leaching chambers inside the bed. Again, it's the underdrain system. It's going to collect the effluent after it's been dosed over top of the 3 8 inch pea gravel treatment medium. So think of these recirculating filters as a big trickle filter. That's really what they are. On the left side, you'll see that we'll fill up the uh, spaces in between the chambers with three quarters to one inch gravel. So we'll have a nice level bottom. Over on the right, you can see that's been done. The gravel's been placed up to the top of the chambers. One thing to note on the right-hand side is you'll see an internal wall inside the recirculating media filter. We size the recirculation rates at 80-20 split, so 80%, 20%. And the portion on the right-hand side of that wall is the 80%. And the smaller portion on the left of that wall is the 20%. So distribution laterals will be put over top of this after the treatment medium is put down. And when we dose, for example, if we dose 100 gallons out to the entire system, on the 80% side, 80 gallons will be returned through that underdrain system back to the recirculation pump tanks. And then that then is going to be redosed out into the system numerous times per day and retreated so that the effluent is a higher quality. The left side, the 20% side, 20 gallons of that 100 gallon dose then will go out to final dispersal. In this case, this is a drip irrigation system that will be taking care of that. That's how Zola typically makes a very quick, easy split of the effluent for our recirculation mix. Okay, so you'll see the picture on the left is a recirculating media filter. It's partially constructed. You'll notice the distribution lines are laying up on top of the treatment medium. The treatment medium, again, for this system is 24 inches of 3 8 inch pea gravel that's been cleaned. Pea gravel will grow the population of bacteria that's necessary for the treatment. So as the effluent is dosed through the treatment medium, bacteria then will use that as a food source for 
and clean the water. Now you also see orifice shields on the left there that are attached to each section of pipe. These orifice shields, what they do is they will protect the one eighth inch diameter orifice that's drilled in these pipes from blockage if it's laying against pea gravel, for example. Over on the right hand side, you're gonna see uh, the laterals have been glued together, do the clean outs in the foreground and in, in the background. Those allow us access to the leaching chamber under drain system that's located down the bottom of the filter. If we have solids accumulate over a period of time, sludges accumulate over a period of time, due to it being a biological filter, then we can bring a septic tank pumper truck or the maintenance provider can, and they can remove that, those solids out of the bottom of the under drain. Okay, on the left side then, you're gonna see a better close up of the zones that we have. I'll talk a bit more about zoning as we move through this, but in these gravel filters and then on the sides of them, we're gonna have a number of zones. And you can see that with the manifolding coming through the pipe boot on the bottom left side, and that'll go out into another manifold, and then there's three laterals that come off of that. So that's a zone one. The one above that then you see is zone two, zone three, zone four, et cetera. But one of the main reasons we do this is because we're only gonna dose one zone at a time. And it allows us to have a smaller pump to do that. We don't have to have a pump this size large enough to dose the entire gravel filter. And that's one of the main benefits is it helps us to keep the pump size and, and the cost down. But also there's some other benefits to it. If we were putting a gravel filter, a recirculating media filter on a, a facility like a, a summer camp, and they're open from let's say May through August or September, and then they close where they greatly scale down their staff, for example, and there's only a maintenance staff there. It allows us to turn off some of these zones. So we don't have to dose the entire gravel filter. We can dose every how many zones that are appropriate for the waste flow during seasonal operation hours. Mm -hmm. On the right hand side, what you'll notice is we're going to cover these distribution laterals with three quarter to one inch stone. So you're going to get a layer of about two inches over top of the piping that's installed. Next slide shows that we'll install a safety fence. So that's what you're looking at is, a, is an arm safety fence. And it has small openings in it. And the reason we do this is because we don't want our children, for example, or pets to burrow into the gravel and get down and come in contact with the wastewater. So it's a safety feature that we build into these. On the right hand side, then you can see where we're going to cover the safety fence with about four to six inches of one inch pea gravel up to the bottom of those knockouts or clean outs. On the left side here, you'll see the, the finished product, all the gravels in, uh, a couple of different kind of clean outs there so we can get in and do maintenance on the system, adjust pressure hood, etc. And nothing is installed over top of the final gravel. Uh, we get that question quite a bit. Do you cover it with mulch? Do you put anything down over it? Do you plant plants on it? And the answer to all those are no. It looks just like it does on the left-hand side here. We want that gravel to remain open for oxygen transfer. Any weeds that grow in there will be picked out by the contractor. And it'll look just like it does on the left-hand side. They'll get a final grade up to the bottom of the uh, wood framing. And grass will get planted. So, as you can see, it's just a rough grade around the outside of it. On the right-hand side, you'll see an example of the zoning that we do. And we use a component called a multi-zone valve, which is the black with the purple top. And you can see the inlet coming into the top of it with the red handle on the ball valve. So you can turn that on or off if you have to do maintenance on it. It has a union on it. On all the outlet pipings and the inlet piping, you can remove that for maintenance if you needed to. There's some clear piping that's installed on the outlets going away where you can see the flow for each one of those zones. So essentially the way these work, you have a dose coming into it and it'll dose zone one. At the end of dose one, it, there's an internal cam that rotates, and as the pump pressures back on for the second cycle, it'll start to flow out to zone two, and then zone three, and then zone four, etc. So this is how we do low cost, very effective zoning. We use, we use multi-zone valves. And Claris has a number of different outlets that we provide, two, four, five outlets, etc. You can see this is a couple of slides that are showing the pump tanks and um, the step systems installed in the dust tanks on the left. 
you see the manifold pipe and supply piping coming out and going up into the gravel filter. Now, you can't see them in this slide, but there's pipe boots are installed there. So every time we cut a hole in that liner, we want to make sure that it's watertight. No water can get in and no water can get out where we pierce the liner with the pipe. So we use pipe boots and those are sealed back onto the liner with a special adhesive that'll glue those boots right onto the liner on the inside. Then we use pipe clamps to hold the pipes securely around the boots. Over on the right hand side you can see three multi-zone valves and how those are going out for the different zones. These multi-zone valves will get a riser installed over top of them and it'll come up to grade, to final grade with the lid on top. Very important that we're able to get back and maintain these because we have to do any maintenance on the zone valves themselves. We build those with kits if, if we have wear over a period of time. So again, we take into account maintenance and how to set that up and make sure that's done you know, during the system design. The cluster systems that we typically work on are a size where we're going to usually have a control house as part of the construction. Control house is going to house the control panels of various types and other components that are necessary to be able to get to, keep dry, have access to, and, and oftentimes secure also so nobody can get to them. And so in this case, we're going to have a number of control panels that will control the dust into the recirculating meeting filter. Again, I mentioned that we have a drip system as a final dispersal system, so we're going to have a control panel for that inside this house where we control the dosing on the drip irrigation system. Always with drip systems, we're going to install just filters that filter to about 110, 115 micron. That's important even though the advanced treatment system, in this case, the recirculating meeting filter, has a very low total suspended solids count. We're going to need to filter that additionally so that the drip emitters don't become plugged out in the drip field. So we usually install these ARCO filters, these disk filters. You see two of them installed on the left in a bank, and those are set to automatically backwash. And so that keeps those filters relatively clean between maintenance intervals. On the right-hand side, you're going to see a couple of UV lights, ultraviolet lights. And we use these also oftentimes on large clustered systems uh, on the drip field because we want to try to reduce as much as we can any bacterial slimes that will form inside that drip tubing. If bacterial slimes do form in the drip tubing over a period of time, those can break off and they can plug drip emitters. So we try to reduce that as much as possible. The tubing that we use has an antibacterial side impregnated into the plastic, but this is just a safety you know, measure that we do. Again, set up for maintenance. We don't want that drip field plug-in at any time. Final dispersal system, uh, the drip irrigation field here, is installed in parts throughout the golf course on the rough and some of the unused areas, uh, buffer areas around the golf course. And you can see it's just a, a vibratory plow on the machine. You can see the row of tubing in the foreground on the left. And you can see small portions of drip tubing sticking up out of the soil. We have the ends taped off to keep soil from coming into them. Those have already been installed. On the right-hand side, you'll see a close-up of a drip tubing under pressure. And this is, uh, this is just an example of what the tubing looks like when it's dripping, when the pump is on. Tubing we typically use has two-foot spaced drip emitters, and they're usually installed two feet apart from each other in trenches, depending on land contours. But when the pump is on, we're emitting right out a half a gallon of effluent per hour out of each drip emitter. So it literally just drips out at a very slow rate, which is very easy typically for the soil to absorb. These drip systems are installed in most cases about six to eight inches deep into the soil. We keep them up into the topsoil, usually the A horizon, where you may have silt loam or silty clay loam. And there's a high population of bacteria, fungi, all kinds of uh, soil fauna there to help digest that waste. Also the roots from the plants, that in, in most cases is going to be grass, will help to evapotranspirate a lot of that effluent. So very good system. We use them oftentimes for clustered systems. On the left is the close up of the vibratory plow. You can see it's just a small plow with a wheel that uh, cuts a cuts a slot into the soil and you got a cable puller that pulls the tubing in. On the right hand side, you'll see an installed portion of the system. Notice the S shaped cuts in the field. Important to keep that in mind 
as we always instruct our installers and engineers that we work with that the system has to be installed on on the natural land contours and that's what you see the s-shaped and so the contractor then is uh, as he installs this he sets his plow for about a six to eight inch depth and he's painted out stripes with orange paint for each lateral and he follows those after he shot them with his laser transit and that's the contour the natural contour of that particular portion of the field so he starts out at six to eight inches deep at the beginning of the trench and he follows the contours and he stays six to eight inches deep throughout the entire excavation until the end of the trench and that's important because the bottom of the trench has to be kept a certain amount of distance over top of any restrictive horizons whether it's fragile pens fresh water tables heavy clay soils rock whatever have you so that we can polish treat in the effluent and it has a chance to move out of the, the drip field profile and so we don't have ponding issues so very important to do that over on the left again a shot of them installing more tubing you can see the s-shaped cuts in the field where they follow the contour on the on the left side you can see one painted orange stripe up on the top that they haven't completed yet right hand side are a bunch of the tubes already installed and They've yet to install the manifold and that's why they're sticking up above the ground with some tape on them to keep soil out. Okay, so cluster systems, just some of the benefits, and there's many. The one that probably I think holds the most truth is the very first sign here. Usually developers want to design their development to have as many lots as possible. And that allows them to have as much income as possible. So this is an attractive solution rural developments that don't have community sewers installed municipal sewers because they can make small lot sizes because only the septic tank is going to be installed on the lot and sometimes a pump tank and that allows them to have a small maybe one third acre lot whereas if they were going to have the pretreatment units on that lot and have the drain field or the final dispersal system installed in that lot they may need two or three times that size of a lot by the time they got the drain field installed and by the time they had some type of repair area left over in case they had a failure. So what this does is it allows the developers usually to have two, three, maybe four times as many lots as they would if they had treatment on the site itself. So that in turn you know, allows them to free up quite a bit of space and a lot more income for additional lots. So you know, it's an attractive thing for the developer to look at. Cluster systems, as the one we just showed you, they have very much the same benefits of municipal systems when the lots are sold. Each of the lots, as I've mentioned earlier, is going to have a, a sewer clean out or a sewer stub out installed, capped on the lot. So to the builder of that home, he's going to hook up to that clean out just like he would if he was on a municipal treatment system. So benefits are very much the same. Homeowners often are going to get billed on a monthly, quarterly, or yearly base, depending on how the ownership of that cluster system is set up. They're going to pay uh, monthly, or quarterly, or yearly, possibly into a homeowners association. Or as the example you saw, in Central Kentucky, the water district took over the maintenance on that system and the billing. So when they get the water bill, they have a line item on the water bill that's a sewer charge and that's the amount that they're charged to maintain that system so very much the same as if you were on municipal systems but a lot of benefits to the developer and the owner of the system when they develop the property cluster systems like most septic systems if they're installed designed maintained properly they're very environmentally friendly they produce high water quality and they don't contaminate the environment to any high degree if they're maintained properly they usually don't have issues with public health they, they protect the public health by remaining below the surface of the ground with no breakouts so uh, sometimes with sanitary sewers we have bypass events during high rain where all or partially treated effluent is diverted to a stream or to a river which is not an environmentally sustainable option it also you know there can be sewer manholes that overflow down the street and you could have contamination locally so anyway these are very very good systems some of the things that the various people that are involved in a cluster system 
need to take into account is you have to plan for it initially. That means the developer, once the idea has been discussed, has to get the right people involved. Soil scientists and others who do soil and site evaluations are key to looking at the property to determine the site and the soil conditions on the property. Regulators are involved from the local health departments, typically their local offices up to the state level. It's important that everybody works together for these systems. Uh, experienced engineering teams or companies are important. They know how to do the design on these systems. And then installation companies too, the contractors who put them in, that's important to work closely with them. All parties at some point as this process moves forward will need to be involved in pre-installation meetings as needed, either at the site or possibly in the engineer's office, regulator's office, and everybody needs to communicate properly about what's going to happen and what happens. The developer will at some point have to decide who's going to own the cluster system. That could be a developer. In many cases, it's a homeowners association that takes over for it. it could be a local utility like the water company that's in central Kentucky that maintains that system. But it's important that somebody owns the system so that there's proper maintenance on the system. And a maintenance plan is key here. Proper maintenance all the way from the home to the pretreatment at each lot, to the collection system, to the advanced treatment system, to the final dispersal system. All that needs to be planned and all parties on the maintenance team need to be well trained. So that'll be the end of this presentation. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, you can contact Zala Company in Louisville, Kentucky, and we'd be glad to help you in any way we can. Thank you.